Hello and welcome today uh, to this how to run a one-shot session of Good Society. I'm V Hendra, one of the curators of Good Society. And so today I wanted to share with you guys some tips and tricks of sort of how I run a one-shot session. Good Society can seem quite a big game and it is um, usually intended for longer campaigns of maybe three or four sessions. Um, or even longer than that. So getting it all in into a one session experience can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, and this is why I wanted to go through um, today with sort of like how I would uh, approach something like that in a convention setting, for example. So uh, in my opinion, the most important thing uh, when doing the one session experience is to deliver like a tight story in the time allowable. So mechanics only need to give the game enough flavor so that players can enjoy the game, but primarily it is best to focus on getting through enough plot um, in, the, in the time that you've got. So normally convention sessions can range from somewhere between three hour sessions to four hour sessions. I found that three and a half hours is uh, the sweet spot usually. Um, three can feel a little bit rushed and four is pretty good. You, you can comfortably get it done within that four, uh, four, four hour mark so that you've got a bit of time and you don't have to run through it as fast. Three and a half though, like I said, sweet spot. Um, as a sort of disclaimer, when I run a um, game, I do like to take hourly breaks. So just five minutes every hour or so to, it, it sort of helps me facilitate it better, uh, sort of think about, take a moment to think about the direction of the story. And I find that it gives players a chance to go to the loo and all that, but also to process the game and sort of keep them um, from burning out and, and and losing focus. So I like to take breaks, um, but that's, uh, and, and in the structure that I'm gonna go through today, um, you might want to do that too. But so, the first thing that you'd be thinking about if you're planning to run a one-shot of Good Society is pre-game. So what are you going to uh, preparing the game beforehand? I've got um, a little, I'll do a little screen share here. Uh, here we go. Right, so there you go. So this is um, preparing. So here, here are sort of the rough steps that I go through um, to prepare for a one-shot for the game. Use a playset in full. It's so much better to use a play, uh, a playset in full because it's going to cut down so much of the setup time. Make sure you know the playset so you've read through the materials. So usually when you're compiling that playset, um, you you should look through it, sort of understand the sort of relationships that you're using and the character archetypes so that uh, during the game, you can be on top of what's happening. You're going to understand, oh, hold on, maybe this relation would work well here or not, or guide the players if need be, in, especially in that backstory phase. And you can um, step in and help players. Oh, this sort of, this is the archetype, this is the family background, here is what they want. And you can make that choosing process a lot faster and easier for players who might be a little bit overwhelmed and not, sh and they're not sure sort of what character they want to pick up so you can explain it. So that's important that you know your material and you know your playset. Um, aside from that, you should get make sure you print out the game materials or you're playing online, that you've got the sharing links available. Um, and really, that's all you need to prepare. That's one of the great things about Good Society, the preparation. It's, it's sort of no prep or zero prep. All of the game is going to get generated when you play. Um, organizationally, if you have access to your players before the session, you might want to email them, uh, contact them before the game and give them the, ga the game materials or a player reference sheet so that if they want to look through it, uh, they can. But usually, uh, if, if you're in a convention or something, you might not uh, be able to do that step. So that's just, that's all I do to prepare before the game. Um, and then what you're really wanting to focus in on is those three hours. So for this video, I wanted to go through um, how I set up my sort of three hour experiences. Um, here is, oh, I might just do another screen share there. Um, so next slide. This is sort of the section structure I use um, for a three hour game. So I'll likely, uh, we'll go through each of these hours um, and I'll talk a little bit about them. 
So the first hour, let's focus in here. The first hour uh, is really important um, because it's going to be the hour where you're going to set up the rest of the game. You're going to do backstory, collaboration. You're going to set the tone for the rest of the experience. So it's very uh, important to sort of get on the good, uh, get get to get on a start off on a good foot. That's it. So firstly, here we can see that uh, I sort of allocate. Oh, so the times are just rough estimates. Um, I like to break it up so that I, I I know I have to get through these things per hour, but um, I allocate sort of times to them. Sometimes it's plus or minus two minutes or, or that sort of thing. You can be a bit flexible when you get to the time, but it's good to know how much you want to fit into each of those. So introduction, seven minutes. Um, as people arrive to the session, I like to make everyone feel welcome. Uh, and once we're ready, we go through and introduce ourselves. That's usually the first thing I do. Um, who, you know, introduce player pronouns, go around the circle, maybe ask them a question that's appropriate, like how much Austin you know, uh, is this the first time you've played Good Society, that sort of thing. Is it a to gauge the, um, you know, where your players are coming from and address any concerns that might have. Also do a base, basic pitch of the game, so uh, like a what to expect. It's usually very broad. Um, I think I usually say something like, you'll be collaborating together to author an Austin novel. You will play a major character, but also be playing supporting characters throughout the game. Um, it'll be very Austin-esque, something like that. Very two-sentence pitch. Um, if you've done your job properly in the lead up to the session, they should be, they should know what they're in for. Um, and then just before you begin, introduce any safety tools that you're using in the session, like X card, open table policy, that sort of thing. So we kick on. Collaboration is the next thing I want to, uh, you know, to start. Collaboration is the next thing. Start the game. Uh, explain briefly what collaboration is. It's a collaborative phase where we can configure this game for our group. We'll be making a few decisions that will be important in how we approach the game today. So in the collaboration phase, you want to make sure that everyone can see the decisions and everyone's got a chance to speak up and that you do actually come to a decision relatively quickly. You don't want, uh, I think in a one session game like this, uh, you want to get collaboration through a quicker than usual. If you're playing a four or five session game or longer, it, it's very much more important to get the tone right. In a one session game, uh, it's likely going to be fairly contained and you don't need to uh, spend as long on this phase. So once you know that that usually doesn't take too long if someone is if you ask a question and no one wants to be the first person to jump in sometimes i'll pick on a player to get them to x what do you think about this okay y okay z and and it just gets the ball rolling so you want to make sure people are speaking and feeling in that collaborative environment um, early on so then we go to backstory which is the main uh thing that hour one is reserved for, because you want to get through all of the backstory before you take your first break. Um, and you don't want this to drag on too long. It can it can do, um, but you've got to be, for a one session game, really, really cognizant of the time here, because it's fun to make characters, but it's funner to play them. And so you're going to try and maximize the time um, for people to play this game. Uh, unfortunately, you do still need to make characters, so. Backstory, here we go. Uh, first one. Oh, MJ, that is totally wrong. It should say it. MC being major character. So I usually do about 22 minutes for the backstory for major characters. With a playset in full, everyone should be picking out uh, their own character sets um, already prepared. You follow the character creation process as it's written in the book. Um, but yeah, keeping that time in mind and, and it's good to be aware of how long you're taking to, to explain stuff. Um, and really in a one session game, what you're trying to do is explain only the things that is relevant for that, that section of the game. So you can keep things going at a good clip. You don't want to bog them down with too much information. So as you're going through this character creation process, you want to be giving attention to the players that might be slower than the others. Um, usually not, uh, I found it's better like not to pressure them per se, but like 
find out what they're finding difficult. Oh, you're having trouble picking a initial reputation. What sort of things were you thinking? Okay, right. Maybe X, Y, Z. So then you can really target your assistants to what they're finding difficult. Um, it's usually more about providing a lot of information for them uh, to be able to make an informed decision. So if they're like, I'm not sure how to make a character that's like this, that's where you can step in and give them sort of, oh, maybe this playset would, would be able to do the thing that you're thinking about. Um, you want to be encouraging dialogue between players at this stage and for them to be talking to each other and making collaborative decisions about their families and, and whatnot, as usual. Um, once you've done major characters, we move on to the connections. Um, it's pretty easy to do the connections. What I normally do is get players to simultaneously do it. So once we've got a good idea of the major characters, I just say, okay, you're going to make two connections for yourself. Uh, let's just go through uh, how to make one, bang, bang, bang. And then uh, how to fill out that connections sheet, or if you're online, how to fill out the little box. Um, and then I just leave, give players a solid three, five minutes to write down all of those details. Uh, once I st start seeing some people are finished, um, I'll get them to present their two connections. Then once you know everyone will sort of catch up, finish and present their two connections, once that's all done, uh, I, that's when you can assign uh, like which player is going to be playing the extra connection. So hopefully, um, if you've been able to uh, help people get through this and uh, sort of, you know, sort of assist players to get into the decisions at a very good clip, then uh, I do think that you can get it done in about forty minutes altogether. So. Uh, it's just being aware of the time and not to let things take too long or things that um, if you find people are fleshing out too much backstory, that's not necessarily needed um, to sort of move the conversation on to important things that need to be defined, but not to go overboard because we will, it's a one shot, you know, we don't need to know all 10 dogs that you own in their names. So, but we do need to know who your overbearing mother is, you know that sort of decision making and guidance is what the facilitator of this one shot, that's your job um, at this point. So once that's all done um, and we've sort of introduced our players, we, uh, we, we can take a five minute, that's for the five minute break. Um, one pro tip, if you are doing breaks, uh, tell people exactly the minute it is and exactly the minute they need to be back. So I usually say something like, it's 55 past the hour now. Let's take a five minute break and right on the hour, we're gonna keep, you know, we're gonna pick it up and go again so that you don't lose, uh, some people sort of lose track of the time, but you wanna keep those breaks short and sweet. And then once uh, you take a break, roll into the second hour. So the second hour, let me pop my screen up again. Here we go, hour two. Our two is where you want to introduce players to the uh, the rules, but we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, and then get them going on that cycle of play. And ideally, you want to get through, like it says there, the novel, the reputation, and the rumors phase. So our two is really where um, players are going to be experiencing the good society um, structure and, and sort of flow of play, um, and it's great to get that all chunked in into hour two. Hour three, um, we're going to jump ahead a little bit, is the epistolary and uh, novel phase and then just the epilogue. So you're going to give them in hour two that big punch intro into what this game's all about. So let's talk about the rules intro. Five minutes, man, that sounds like a really short time to explain everything uh, in the rule set of Good Society. It is, so don't do don't do that. <laughs> what you want to do is to explain the rules that players need to know to participate effectively in the game. They don't need to know everything else about the system. I find it's best to just give them the tools that they're going to use. Um, those three things are, and I explain them in this order usually, resolve tokens. Number one thing, resolve tokens, explain how they're used, explain how they use them, and how they can use resolve tokens to affect the story connections and major characters. Um, if you've got a player sh reference sheet handy for, for them to look at, you can point this out there as well. Second thing, reputation tags. Explain what they are and then how you can use them like resolve tokens. 
You can mention that if you stack up on three, that a condition triggers, but you can, um, and, and what sort of that looks like, uh, but you don't sort of need to dwell on that. Just most people are happy knowing, oh, something happens if three is stacked. And then the last thing is the monologue token, which is really exciting and important to explain because you want people to use the monologue tokens. And because it's a one session game, everyone's going to use it before the end of this session. So explain what a monologue token is, what it does, and to use it before the end of this session. People will forget and you will remind them that they still have their monologue tokens. So those are basically the three things that I explain at this point, because um, we don't want people to get sort of overwhelmed with information, just need to know the things they need to know for the next bit. So those three things um, is, is important to uh, explain at this point. Then we roll straight into that first novel chapter where they can use some of these uh, mechanics and um, start introducing and getting into the feel and skin of the characters. So the first novel chapter um, is usually a little shorter than the, the second one uh, in, in hour three. But in hour two, uh, I like to do a novel chapter almost always in a one shot. I start with a ball. Um, I like to start with sort of short scenes introducing the major characters and their connections in their own little environment. So, um, you know, I start off in maybe at home and then moving them towards a big event. So, for example, we start with the host of the ball, preparing the ballroom, um, maybe another scene of a different character in their home getting dressed get you know a shot of two characters in the carriage and what they're talking about on the way to the ball and then you know like the last major character arriving being greeted at the ball and so you kind of get that progression of the evening but you also get all of the intro scenes with the character it's a good shorthand intro bit that i've done often and it works really well um for these first few scenes i usually use pretty hard scene scene framing so Lots of leading questions, lots of um, getting people to understand the world and their character and, um, you know, putting them in, in a situation already, right? Like, uh, rather than them initiating it, I tend to, at this stage anyway, initiate it, uh, initiate all those things and drop them into the action. Once the intros are sort of done and people get a sense or a flavor of their character and their situation, um, and the ball is starting proper, uh, I tend to open it up to the table for players to suggest their own scenes and what they want to do and see in um, this ball. And that's important because it sets the tone of like what you're able to do with this game and, and for players to follow their uh, desires. Um, and it also sort of gets that collaborative um, feel at the table, like um, you're handing over the tools of authorship to the players. So, while players are suggesting scenes, and, and what the first one or two, maybe you, you've got to pick on someone if, if no one wants to jump straight in, so sort of icebreaker it. Um, but once, you know, you'll find people start getting excited and, and then everyone wants a scene. But you as the facilitator, here's the three goals that you have in this first novel chapter. Play a resolve token early, early on. Illust that's to illustrate how they're used so that you can set an example for the rest of the table. Two. Find interesting threads in the story that you can sort of follow for the rest of this. Um, and the players sort of have the responsibility to do this, of course, as well. But you know, if you know the game better than they do, or if you're not playing a major character yourself, um, you've actually got more my mental space to sort of, ah, oh, yeah, that's going to be a really interesting um, plot to follow through this session. So that's, that's goal two. And the last goal um, that you want to be thinking about is to highlight each major character and their desire. So if um, players aren't following their desire, maybe suggest a scene for them that um, has that tension um, and what they want to do about it, basically. So you, you, it's sort of related to two because you, you're kind of wanting to find the most interest, interesting threads, but those are going to be probably around the desires. So those are the things that you want to be doing in the first novel chapter. You don't want the first ball thing to go on too long because there's so much more stuff, um, plot and uh, character development that's going to happen through the next few phases. So as soon as the ball gets a little bit boring and someone's like, hmm, I'm not sure if there's anything else I want to do, 
cut it. It's better early than not. And that's sort of why I give a time limit sort of in my own head um, because then I know that it's not going to go on too long. Uh, it's almost always better to cut this first novel chapter shorter than you would think. So that's the first novel chapter. Let's ship it. Uh, the next thing that you're going to do is go into the reputation and rumor and scandal phase before the second hour break. Um, in a longer game, these phases are more important because they signal how your character is seen and in, in the case of rumors, what interesting directions the plot might take over the long run. In a one session game, these things are going to have much less impact because you're not going to be able to have that much time to use them. By that logic, um, I don't like to spend too long on these things, but I like to uh, go through the process because it's fun as well to make do the reputation and the rumors inherently fun. But uh, in terms of the explanation, keep it short and sweet uh, for reputation. Explain what each is required for each player. Like, I, uh, you know, it's time to assess your reputation criteria and see how that first ball went for your character. Did it go well? Did it go badly? Um, let's go around and say if we go well or badly or both, and then uh, let's help each other think of tags and then write them down. So usually um, you can get through that pretty quickly. And then you remind players, you know, uh, these reputation tags can be used like resolve tokens like we spoke about earlier on. Then you move straight into the rumor and scandal phase. Um, you kind of, it takes a little bit longer maybe to explain, uh, say what this phase is about. You know, we create the rumor and gossip playing around town, how it works. So, you know, we'll each take two turns going one way and then going back the other way. So that last person has a double turn. On your turn, you can either create a rumor or spread a rumor. That's it. That's all sort of um, what you need. You might have to explain, like, so what a rumor is, what's a spread rumor versus an unspread rumor. That's one more thing to explain. And then uh, you can go through that process. So it's usually pretty fun. Um, and I love rumor and scandal phase. You might get one or two rumors used in the session, but um, or one and two reputation, but it's unlikely that you're going to get a whole like you're going to get you're not going to churn through them. All right, and then it's time for the second break. So, if you've got a few extra minutes, if you're not butting up against the end of that hour, um, just before the break, I like to explain that we're go about to go into the epistolary phase and. Uh, we're going to be writing letters, so maybe think about what sort of letters you want to write. So then, let's see, we're going to get you know, getting on to the third hour here. So in the third hour, this is the hour um, that the a lot of the plot is going to crest, crest like a wave, so crest and um, hit that breaking point, and then we sort of get the end of the story, the climax. So hour three tends to be a lot of plot happening. Um, there should be actually, there should be in the previous um, hour two, uh, in the rumors, we should already start feeling an escalation, but hour three is when it's gonna hit and it's gonna reach that peak. So hour three, you're going to do the epistolary phase, you're gonna do the last novel chapter and you're going to just, you're gonna end on the epilogue, which is the second epistolary phase. Um, Obviously, because it's only one session, we cut out the second reputation phase because you're never going to have time to use those tags. Uh, so in terms of hour three, I like to, just as we're coming back from that, that break between hour two and hour three, explain, hey, we're coming up to the last section of the game or the last you know three phases of the game. We're going to be doing letters. We're going to have one more novel chapter, and then we're going to end the game. This sort of helps signal to your players um, how to time and pace uh, what they're planning as well. So a pistolary phase always goes down well um, and is really, really actually great um, in a one session game of, of getting maybe a time skip in there to sort of give um, that plot a bit more uh, time to keep moving um, and churn through a lot of time and plot. So two letters each from your major character connection. It's basically all the rules that, that people need at this stage. You might have to remind players who haven't used their monologue tokens that, you know, this is the last hour 
and they should watch for an opportunity to use those. Um, but otherwise, this epistolary phase tends to be quite an easy phase and players and people inherently pick it up very well. Um, so 13, 15 minutes for that. Um, more importantly is after that, we go into the novel um, chapter. So this last novel chapter is usually in um, one session, I, I tend to do a visitation chapter. It's great for two reasons. Um, one, it gives players a spotlight because each player is going to go and, and sort of frame their own scene and their own visitation. So it gives people a chance to be spotlighted, which is great. And secondly, it helps the plot to develop quickly in a short space of time. Because people are going to have their sidebars, um, they're going to go and do do things on on their turn to frame a scene. Um, yeah. So sorry. So uh, the lot like the other reason why I do really like using a visitation here is because um, it's really good to to sort of um, have one of these visitations be almost like a mini event. Uh, chapter where everyone is conveniently there. It doesn't always work out this way, but it's nice when it does because then you've got another opportunity where everyone is there with their characters um, or every player is present in a scene even if they're playing their connection or their main character. Um, once you've done that second novel uh, chapter, it's time obviously to go into the epilogue. Uh, and the Epilogue is very much uh, just a second, uh, you know, just a, a way to wrap up and for players to be able to own the futures of their characters and to get a satisfying conclusion to the story. Um, the goals before the end of the game that you should be trying to hit before that epilogue is that you want, one, all the monologue tokens uh, used. It's good if uh, everyone... Usually a lot get used in that in that last novel chapter, but because it's got a lot of visitation scenes, you've got a lot of opportunities to, to use them, and that's great. Um, you want everyone to be spotlighted, like I said, and you want that story, plot, or arc to come to, to sort of a head. It doesn't maybe need to resolve cleanly or anything like that, but to have a sense of closure is always great in a one-session game. It, um, it will naturally do that with the upload because you get a little bit more time. Um, and that's basically how I would run a three-hour session of Good Society, roughly. Um, I know, like I said, <laughs> I have really precise minutes here, but I don't stick to them necessarily either. Uh, plus or minus, like I said, two minutes or so. It's just great to have a time limit to um, sort of keep in the back of your head because it keeps your explanations to a particular length of time and you can understand how much time you're going to give each part. Um, and what I like about that structure is, and then how many minutes are assigned to those things, is that it really gives players a lot of time to play um, and be in character and as well as give players a good sense of what, you know, a longer Good Society game might look like. A lot of players do say um, something along the lines like it feels like pi the pilot episode of a longer season. And um, to a degree, that's definitely true um, because it's hard to do a Jane Austen style story in, in such a compressed time because it's inherently quite a slow um, paced novel, right? Um, the movies are a good example here and how choppy and uh, short some of those scenes are because they are two hours, two and a half hours in length. Um, and they're obviously they're gonna be much tighter scripted than what you're coming up with on the table, but take inspiration from how the direction um, is done in those movies, you know, uh, cut things before they get stale, cut things just after the, in, you know, they get interesting, but before they overstay their welcome. Um, be very aware of, uh, getting people through the phases. And so that's that's my tips for today. I hope that helps out um, for all, any of you guys running session convention sessions or sessions at home that had only one session con self-contained experiences. And let me know how you, you sort of structure it and what works for you and whether this, you know, because I don't think everyone needs to run it in the same way as I do, but I, this is how I, I tend to approach it. Um, yeah, so I hope you guys all have fun playing your one session game.